The following contains mature content. You've been warned. From Wondery, I'm Mark Ramsey, and this is part two of Inside... Mark 9.14 Before Jesus was a man and his son, and the son was possessed by his spirit. He could not speak. He would throw himself on the ground and gnash his teeth. Rigid, he would foam at the mouth. It was terrifying. Jesus' disciples had tried to drive out the spirit, but they could not. How long has he been like this? From childhood, teacher, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him, Please, take pity on us and help us. Everything is possible for one who believes. Jesus raised his hand before the kneeling, wrenching boy. You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The boy looked like a corpse. But Jesus took him by the hand and gently raised him to his feet. Later, his disciples asked him, Teacher, why couldn't we cast out this demon? This kind comes out only by prayer. What is possession? The official book of Catholic rituals, known as the Roman Rituals, was first published in 1614. And here's what it says. If you're able to speak in a strange tongue or to understand it when spoken by another, if you have the ability to divine future or hidden events, if you display physical powers which are beyond your age or condition, taken as a whole, these suggest possession. What does it feel like to be possessed? In the 17th century, in one of the most famous cases of possession in history, a Jesuit priest found himself taken. I find it almost impossible to explain what happens to me during this time, how this alien spirit is united to mine as though I had two souls. I feel as if I had been pierced by the pricks of despair. I cry aloud, and the cries come from both souls at once. It is both joy and frenzy. I can feel myself becoming a devil. March 10, 1949, Mount Rainier, Maryland. Robbie's parents had been advised to seek out a Catholic priest. Robbie's father called the rectory of the nearest Catholic church. Father Albert Hughes was brought to the phone. He had been expecting their call. Father, my wife sprinkled holy water in every room of the house. She placed the bottle on a dresser in Robbie's room and lit candles around it. The bottle lifted into the air and smashed against a wall. When I lit one of the candles, the flames shot to the ceiling. I was afraid the house would catch fire. Father Hughes arrived at Robbie's home that night. The priest was taken by Robbie's parents up the stairs to his room. Robbie was on the bed, still, restraints around his arms and feet. 
The priest moved around the room, watching Robbie watch him. That's when he heard the words in Latin. O priest of Christ, you know that I am the devil. Why do you keep bothering me? Father Hughes was chilled. He knelt beside the bed, opened the Roman ritual, and began to read. Holy Mother of God, Saint Gabriel, Saint Michael, all ye holy angels and archangels, all ye holy virgins and widows, all ye holy men and women, saints of God, deliver us from all evil, from all sin, from thy wrath, from sudden and unlooked for death, from the snares of the devil. At the mention of one word, devil, Father Hughes noticed Robbie's arm had slipped out of its restraint. He had reached down the side of the bed and worked loose a bed spring. Father Hughes screamed and struggled to his feet. Robbie had slashed the entire length of his arm from shoulder to wrist. Blood was everywhere. The priest's arm was hanging, limp, dripping. He would need more than 100 stitches to close that wound. Curiously, Father Hughes never mentioned this incident in his own retelling of the story, and he never continued the exorcism. He left the parish soon after. Friends said he had suffered a breakdown. Forevermore, he could raise only one arm when he celebrated Mass. He was withdrawn, frightened. He was forever haunted. Robbie's family was inconsolable. Now what? They had relatives in St. Louis. Maybe, maybe this is what they needed, a fresh start. Maybe it's time to move. That was Robbie. They rushed up the stairs. He was in the bathroom, staring into the mirror, shaking. His pajama top was open, scratched in blood. Across his chest was one word. Louis. Robbie's parents were in shock. We'll go to St. Louis. We'll go to St. Louis. His mother asked her husband, for how long? Sprawled across Robbie's chest in blood. Three and one half weeks. Robbie's body and the Ouija board had become one. On Saturday, March 5, they boarded an overnight train to St. Louis. Maybe it would be over. Maybe this would be the end. Maybe the demon would leave them in peace. Tuesday, March 8, 1949. Good night, Robbie. Good night. So far, so good. They were settling in with their relatives in St. Louis. What is that? I, th I think it's coming from Robbie's room. Robbie's parents threw open the door. Robbie wasn't moving, but the bed was shaking violently, flopping up and down. Robbie tears open his pajama top. Zigzag scratches oozing blood spanned his chest. He was afraid, he was helpless. From inside the mattress, the sound of scratching up and down as if something was trying to escape. It was time to find another priest and end this hell once and for all. The Archbishop of the Diocese assigned the task to Father William Bodern, 52, a Jesuit priest and a native of St. Louis. There was one 
condition. He had to promise never to discuss this exorcism with anybody. Bodern enlisted the help of his protege, a Jesuit student, 26-year-old Walter Halloran. Robbie was silent when the men joined his family and surrounded his bed. This was their first look at the boy. He did not look terrifying or evil. His features were not altered. More than anything, he appeared frightened and alone. And that's when the bed began to move, up and down. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Pray for us. From thy wrath, O Lord, deliver us. From the snares of the devil, O Lord, deliver us. From the spirit of fornication, O Lord, deliver us. From lightning and tempest, O Lord, deliver us. From plague, famine, and war, O Lord, deliver us. From everlasting death, O Lord, deliver us. Strike terror, O Lord, into the beast that lays waste thy vineyard. Grant confidence to thy servants to fight against that reprobate dragon, lest he dare despise those who put their trust in thee. Let thy powerful right hand prevail upon him to depart from thy servant Robert. As Bodern made the sign of the cross over Robbie's bed, the shaking had stopped. Robbie cowered on the bed, his hands clutching the sheets, his eyes drifting up to the light. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. I command thee, I command thee, unclean spirit, wherever thou art, along with all thine associates who have taken possession of this servant of God. Robbie threw off his bedding. His pajama top was open. Long red welts appeared from nowhere. Thou shalt tell me by some sign thy name and the hour of thy departure. I command thee, moreover, to obey me to the letter. I, who though unworthy, am a minister of God. Blood was appearing on Robbie's legs, his thighs, his stomach, his back. He covered his eyes in horror. Bodern and Halloran pulled his hands away from his eyes. Tears of blood were raining down his cheeks. Robbie looked down to his chest. There, plain as day, four letters etched into his flesh, streaming blood. The letters H-E-L-L. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, I cast thee out, thou unclean spirit. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God for all ages. Amen. Robbie stopped moving. He closed his eyes. He sat up and faced the headboard of the bed. They said later, he kept that up for hours, banging his head against the wall, neither awake nor asleep, in some kind of of trance. Hollywood, 1965. Mr. Hitchcock, we'll see you now. Billy Friedkin had directed a well-regarded documentary, The People vs. Paul Crump. It had become his calling card in Hollywood. One print made its way to the producer of TV's Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Would Mr. Friedkin be interested in directing an episode of The Hitchcock Hour? Why, yes, he would. That episode was written by Robert Block, the same man who penned the novel Psycho. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Hitchcock. It's a great honor. Hitchcock was in his trademark uniform, a black suit and blue tie. Hitch extended his hand. It was like a dead fish. Friedkin gripped it. Hitch looked him over, and he did not like what he saw. Mr. Friedkin, it's customary for our directors to wear a tie. Oh, <laughs> I, I guess I need to buy one of those one of these days. That was the best he could muster. Hitch turned away. He was not amused. That 
would be that. Friedkin was humiliated. He was embarrassed. Only once more would their paths cross. Things would be different next time. Hollywood, September 1966. A spacious bungalow on the Paramount lot. Blake Edwards was one of the hottest writer-producer-directors in the business. Days of Wine and Roses, The Pink Panther, Breakfast at Tiffany's, that Blake Edwards. And he wanted to meet Friedkin over breakfast. He wanted Billy to direct a movie version of his TV series, Peter Gunn. But first, he wanted input on the script. Friedkin, I've seen your work and I like it. I'd love for you to direct a movie version of Peter Gunn. What'd you think about the script? Well, Well, Mr. Edwards, I think the script sucks donkey balls. It was as if space and time had stopped. Blake Edwards, the Blake Edwards, was frozen. He had been chewing an English muffin, but now he stopped and swallowed hard. What did you say? <clears throat> I, uh, uh, well, I, I, I don't like it at all. This may be the worst thing I've ever read. <clears throat> there were two others in the room. One coughed slightly. The other, sitting in a dark corner, said nothing. But now, Blake Edwards was standing. I am so grateful for your opinion, Friedkin. How else would I make it through the day without your opinion? Look, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Mr. Edwards. I want to work with you, but this project would have to start from scratch. From, from, from scratch? Who, who the hell do you think you are? Some punk kid, fresh off the street. No mailroom experience, no credits, and you're telling me from scratch? Well, there was nothing left to say but goodbye. Freakin' was disappointed as he walked towards the Paramount parking lot. That lot was actually an enormous tank. It's where Cecil B. DeMille had once filmed The Parting of the Red Sea. Freakin' could use some sort of intercession from God right now. Freakin'! There was a man running towards Billy. It was the man in the corner of Edward's office, the one who said nothing. Freakin', my name is William Peter Blatty, Bill Blatty. We haven't met, but I, uh, I was in Blake's office just now. I'm the guy who wrote the script. Oops. Um, look, Mr. Blatty, I'm, I'm sorry No, no, if... no, 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 no. It's okay. The script doesn't work. Look, Bl- <laughs> Blake's a busy man, and he doesn't care that much. He just wants to get it made. You are the only one who looked him in the eye and told him the truth. And I respect that because it cost you the job, but you did the right thing anyway. Friedkin thanked him and they went their separate ways. But Blatty would not forget that principled filmmaker. He would not forget the director who would not settle for mediocre. He would not forget William Friedkin. January 1970. A one-room guest house in Encino Hills, California. From 11 at night until dawn for weeks on end, Bill Blatty is writing a new book, fiction. All his career, he had been a humorist. The New York Times once wrote, nobody can write funnier lines than William Peter Blatty. His movie scripts included comedies like the second Pink Panther film, A Shot in the Dark. But the work was unsteady, and he had to eat. So now, he had something different in mind. An idea that had been haunting him, festering in him since he first heard it described back at Georgetown in 1949. It was an idea that had possessed him and would not let him go. This would be it, this story. His next best alternative was to collect unemployment. He hoped only that it would be reviewed with respect and that it would not be mocked. He would call it The Exorcist. Brooklyn, 1971. Gene Hackman went to acting school because he didn't know what else to do. 
What could go wrong? He never bothered to think about that, and neither did Billy Friedkin when they made The French Connection. The movie's most celebrated scene features Gene as Detective Popeye Doyle chasing an elevated train. A stunt driver did the dangerous part, and it was. As Friedkin later wrote, 26 blocks at 90 miles an hour through busy intersections, through red lights with no traffic control, no permits, no safeguards of any kind. Only the driver's chutzpah, his skills behind the wheel, and the grace of God. But the reaction shots, those were all Gene Hackman. The camera was mounted on the hood of the Pontiac aimed at Gene. There was a two-way radio on the seat beside him. Billy's voice buzzed through the radio. Gene, you've had a shitty day. You're pissed. Look up at the tracks. Look, look up. You're going to hit something. Gene, you're going to hit. Turn the wheel. Turn the wheel. God damn it. Turn it. Turn it. Turn it. Look right. Look right. A car's going to hit you. A baby in a carriage. Swerve. Swerve. God damn it, Gene. Swerve. The sequence was extraordinary and foolishly risky. As Friedkin later confessed, no one was hurt, thank God. I was exhausted and terrified, but I got it in the can. Why did I take things so far? Because, like Ahab, Kurtz, or Popeye, I was obsessed. Spring 1970. Bill Blatty is still nose down writing his magnum opus. He had tracked down Father Bodern, who was reluctant to help. You see, Bodern had promised the diocese authorities he would keep quiet, and he feared any publicity would disrupt the real-life haunted boy. It's a letter to Blatty from Father Bodern. He wrote, My own thoughts were that much good might have come if the case had been reported and people had come to realize that the presence of the devil is something very real. Blatty could feel his mouth dry. He kept reading. I can assure you of one thing. The case in which I was involved was the real thing. I had no doubt about it then, and I have no doubt about it now. Bill Blatty would finish his book, and it would become a number one New York Times bestseller. Next stop, Hollywood. There, this best-selling book would become one of the most terrifying movies ever made. Next time on Inside the Exorcist. Do you know why we're here? It's an excellent day for an exorcism. From Wondery, this is a seven-part deep dive inspired by the story behind an unforgettable classic movie. This is Inside the Exorcist. Written and narrated by Mark Ramsey, featuring Stephanie Drake as Linda Blair. Sound design and editing by Jeff Schmidt. Produced by Mark Ramsey Media. Consulting producer Jeffrey Glazer. Executive producer Hernan Lopez for Wondery. We'd like to learn more about you. Please complete a short survey at wondery.com slash survey and subscribe to this show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It's free. For more information or to comment on this show, visit our website, wondery.com slash inside exorcist or facebook.com slash inside exorcist. If you like the show, we'd love you to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps others discover us. Tweet us at inside exorcist. Please thank us by rewarding our sponsors with your support. And please, support Linda Blair's Animal Rescue Foundation at lindablairworldheart.org.